Amen. We are still in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Uh, we are continuing our conversation from last week um, about the awesome advantage of the ascension from 1 Corinthians 2, verses 6 through 12. You don't have to stand. We're not going to read again. We're going to move right into the word of God because we want to try to get done um, today. Amen. Amen. With this conversation. Amen. 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 So let me see if y'all recall on last week. Um, when I say that we have that, you know, we thank God for Emmanuel. Let me see if I recall what Emmanuel meant other than just God with us. Amen. Let me see how many people are writing it down. Amen. So when I say when I say when I say Emmanuel, God with us, what am I talking about? What's that? What's the term? Elohim. Elohim who deliberately decided to dwell with us. And, it's, and then the other one is Elohim what? <laughs> Elohim who was intentionally and intimately involved in your life daily. And the reason why <laughs> somebody was writing it down. And the reason why that is so important for you and I to understand is because Elohim is the creator God. Elohim is God coming and coming alongside of us and dwelling with us. Amen. So it's just not, Elohim, the name means that he dwells with you and I. God is the position, Elohim is the name. Yes. And I want us to understand that you call on his name. Amen. And so that's, that's what Emmanuel, if you don't get anything else, uh, hopefully you will though, but if you don't, remember. You know, the awesome advantage of the ascension is that you now have Emmanuel, you now have God, Elohim, deliberately deciding to dwell with you daily. You have Elohim, who literally um, and intently, intentionally um, and intimately indwells you Amen. daily. That didn't happen before you got saved. That didn't even happen um, before Jesus had to leave to go back to be with the Father. Amen? Amen. 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 So today when we're going to finish up this conversation, you know, and it's always, you know, sometimes it's good to be able to just have, you know, take a break between, you know, as you're getting ready to share the word. Because in that time, I was listening to an, a message by Dr. Evans. And, and, and it brought me back to something I used to say all the time, um, but I, just, I had stopped saying. And that was that we, we always hear about having our five senses. But do you know that not just when you got saved, but when Jesus literally ascended, you and I were given a sixth sense. Okay. Uh, I'll, see, I'll see if you can understand a little bit more. Amen. You were given a sixth sense. Amen. Y'all remember growing up, you know, you, those the old the old saints would say they would say, you know, um, you know, God gave me five senses, I'm gonna use them. Uh -huh. Y'all remember saying that? God gave me five good senses, and I'm gonna use them. Yes, yes. I mean, and, that, and that's good. You, you're supposed to. He gave us five good senses, you know, 
the, the sight, you know, the hearing, the smell, the taste, you know, the touch. He gave us, because those senses, the, the, those five senses would, would, would acclimate us to the external world. You know, you could taste, you could hear, you could touch, you know. And so those senses would acclimate us, would, would be able to help navigate us through this external world. Yeah. So you needed those five senses. But the awesome advantage of the ascension is that God gave you and I a sixth sense. That's right. I thought y'all would have been jumping yeah. up and down on that yeah. one. Yeah. Because the reason why he gave us a sixth sense is because he had to get us back to the day of before Adam sinned. Before, yeah, before Adam sinned. Uh, Minister Glow say Adam and Eve, but I'm, I'm giving Eve a break because it really wasn't Eve. It was actually Adam who messed it all up. So I, I, I want to put the blame where the blame goes. And so, and so when, when he sinned, Everything came down. Yeah, yeah. Communication was broken. So there was no communication. Yeah. So it went from having six senses to having five. Mm. And so when, when we got saved uh, and the Holy Spirit, and, and, and I'm sorry, when Jesus went back to be with the Father, he then, he, he then unleashed the sixth sense called the Holy Spirit. Right. Y'all ought to be happy about that. Well, you have it. Well, maybe after I explain why that is so important in the next few, the next few points, you, you'll, you'll see why that is so important for you and I. You know, because see, you and I, see, we have to understand that. Um, I, I, let, me, let me back up. I read a book a few years ago called The Community of Self. It was by Dr. Naeem Akbar. He's a psychologist out of, out of um, Florida. And um, in there, he talked about the community of self. And he said in the, that the self is made up of a community, the ego, the, you know, the senses, you know, the, the drives. And, and he says, and so one of, the, one of the communities, one of the participants in this community of self is called the senses. Okay? And uh, since so Kim, those senses, he says, are what we call, I call them the seers of the self. S-E-E-R-S, -E -E the seers. In other words, the senses help connect us to everything outside of us. Okay, let me see if I'm, let me see. Y'all remember when y'all was, you know, young and dating? Um, y'all, you know, certain songs will come, on, will come on the radio and you start jamming. <laughs> I won't get too deep in that, Mr. Jackson, but you, you remember that. And so then all of a sudden you would hear the song, you know, and then 20 years later, if you heard that same song, what you heard took you back to yeah. it then back then, right? Yeah, yeah. And and when it took you back then, you could even smell the you could even smell the atmosphere that was back then. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm just trying to help you out because what was happening is your senses uh -huh. were telling you to remember. What happened then? Yeah. As you're listening to what's happening now. But all that was outside of you. Yeah. And so Naeem says that at the end of the day, the senses teach us and help us to navigate this external world. But remember I told you that's not the, that's not the only world that we have to navigate. Right. We have to navigate the spiritual world. Yeah. Yeah. We are spiritual beings in physical bodies. We are what you call a dual citizen, and we have dual citizenship in the spirit world as well as the physical world. And as Dr. As Dr. Evans always says, so therefore, what you, if, you, if, if all you see is what you see, you haven't seen all there is to be seen. So if all you see is what's in front of you physically, you ain't seen everything. And you can't see everything if you don't have your sixth sense. Okay? And your sixth sense happened to be called the Holy Spirit. Y'all follow me? Yeah. So the awesome advantage of this ascension is that we were given our sixth sense back. Uh -huh. Hallelujah. But there's a reason why we need that sixth sense. 
Amen? Amen. So let's look at what Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, the 6th through the 12th verse about what I'm calling the sixth sense, a.k.a. the Holy Spirit. So as we go back into 1 Corinthians, uh, and we look at uh, this, let me, let me get to verse, verse 9 and 10. He says, but as it is written, I has not seen, here we go, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has apocalyptus. God has revealed them to us. Stop right there. He revealed them to us through his spirit. So in other words, there's some stuff that we can't see unless God, through the sixth sense, revealed that to us. And evidently, it must be important enough for us to really see what we can't see. Because if it wasn't that important, then God would not have given us someone to help us see what we can't see. So the, our sixth sense will first immaculately illuminate the ways of God in our life. The sixth sense, the Holy Spirit, will immaculately illuminate the ways of God in our lives. The term immaculate means to be clean. It means to be pure and perfect. So yes, the Holy Spirit will perfectly illuminate the ways of God. What am I saying? What, what's happening is he says here that no eye have seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us. Yeah. Yeah. That term reveal, it comes from that, the Greek word apocalyptos, which means to peel back and to pull off of. It's written in what you call the aorist, an indicative active term, which simply means that it's only it's done at one time. It don't have to be done again and again and again. Oh, you missed that right there. So it says, God revealed them to us through his Holy Spirit. So when you got saved, he pulled the blinders off. Yes, yes. He's, when, when you got saved, he removed the veil. When you got saved, he, he, he allowed you to see behind the veil. When you and I got saved, he allowed us to see him through the Holy Spirit. In other words, he, he immaculately illuminated his ways to you and I because before that happened, we didn't know the way of God. We couldn't know the way of God because we never went the way of God. We couldn't comprehend the way of God. Our faculties will not allow us to comprehend the ways of God because we could not, our finite minds could never comprehend uh -huh. the infinite. Yes, yes. Amen. So it says, but God has revealed them to us mm -hmm. through his spirit, yeah. the sixth sense. Now that might not get you. You know, because, you know, you, you figure you're probably doing your own thing and you can go your own way and, you know, and do all that. But, but you know, I was looking in um, Proverbs. So in Proverbs 3, don't go there. Uh, Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 8. I, I, if you want the scriptures, I'll give them to you afterwards. In, in Proverbs 3, verse 5 through 8, it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not to your own understanding. Y'all know that. Yes. In all your ways, no. acknowledge you. No. Acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. He says, see, because when acknowledgement comes, submission hits. And when submission hits, you say, okay, God, I'm going to follow you where you want me to go. You missed that right there. And so in all your ways, acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Yeah. Woo. Yeah. That's the scripture. Yeah. Acknowledge him in all your ways because when you acknowledge him in your ways, all you simply saying is that I'm going to submit now to you and you're going to show me the right way. I'm going to line up with your way and I'm going to follow you around on your way and not mine. Yeah. Uh -huh. 
In other words, I'm going to walk your path, Lord, and not mine. Remember I told y'all a few weeks ago that what happens is that when you walk the pathway that God has set you on, provisions are already there waiting for you, and he'll provide every step of the way as long as you're walking the path that he's called you to walk, and not somebody else. Romans 8 says this, and I'm going to kind of step on and step off of this. In verse 32, he says, Now therefore, listen to me, my children, for blessed are those who keep my ways. This is a preacher talking about God in Proverbs. He says, Hear instruction and be wise, and do not disdain it. Dis disdain what? Wisdom, and do not disdain instruction. Blessed is the man who listens to me, watching daily at my gates, waiting at the post. He says, he says you, will, you will be blessed. If you allow me to immaculately illuminate my ways to you, because if you walk in my ways, you will be blessed because you walk in my ways. Because blessing means simply this, that you are going to walk in obedience. You, you're going to walk the sanctified path of God in obedience to God. And that sanctified path plus your obedience leads to your blessing. Well, Y'all might be familiar with this, this, old, this old psalm. It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down the green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Did y'all forget why he said for his name's sake? I, you look at him. He says, he leads me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Why? You are his namesake. But not only are you his namesake, but he's leading you in that pathway for the sake of his name. You missed that. See, we are his namesake because we're now born again. But now he leads us so that people can see us walking this pathway of God and see the blessings and benefits in our obedience as we walk the sanctified path. And therefore, they'll see how God takes care of you when you walk in his ways for his name's sake and for the sake of his name. That's why you have to have the sixth sense, the Holy Spirit. But then, let's keep going because I only got a few minutes and I got three more points. But then, not only does he immaculately illuminate the ways of God when you get yourself out the way and you stop thinking that you're smarter than he is. But then secondly, um, he intently investigates the works of God. Now, I'm not making this up. I'm not making this up. Y'all got your Bibles open, right? You got your Bibles open? All right, let's go back to 1 Corinthians, the second chapter. Let's look at verse 10, B. Look what it says here. It says, for the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. Yes, yes. Oh, man, y'all. Yeah. Yes. Y'all must have had a hard night last night. See, that should excite you. It says, the Spirit searches all things, yeah, even the deep things things of God. Why? Because you can't get deep. You can't search the things of God. You can't search the works of God. In other words, the spirit intently investigates. In other words, when he says search, that really is when you go back into, into the, the, um, the original language, it really means a deep investigation. Why? Because he want to make sure that you know what God has for you. Okay, so the awesome advantage of the, of the ascension is that the sixth sense, the Holy Spirit, he does investigating of the works of God. In other words, so that way he can tell you the works that God need, that God wants you to do. Okay, let me see if I can have, if I got an example. You know, do you know, you know why Jesus used to always kind of go away? You know, he do some miracles, uh, and, and, and then, you know, in the gospel, when, we, when you read through the gospels, Jesus do a few miracles, and then all of a sudden, he disappear. Uh -huh. and, then, and then disappear, um, uh, and then as he disappears, he disappears out into, you know, the wilderness somewhere, and he begins to pray. Uh -huh. He begins to pray. And so, while he's praying, the Lord is downloading some other stuff into him, yeah, yeah. so that he can go ahead and begin to do some other works. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, 
The apostles, the disciples, wanted him to keep doing stuff there because, you know, and I forget, in, in the book of John, it's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Go there and look and see for yourself because there's more than one time he does this, and he'll be doing works, and, and, and up, he'll just up and leave and go and pray, and then all of a sudden he's going a whole different direction. Why? Because he, because he has, the Lord has downloaded into him where he wants him to go next. Yeah. Yeah. See, it is never about your works first. But it's always about his works. Yeah. But what the Holy Spirit does is he intently investigates the works of God. Then he comes back and he downloads those works yeah. into your spirit. Yeah. Man, I thought y'all have been happy about that. So in other words, then I don't have to worry about uh, Sister Hattie's works. I don't have to worry about Sister Velveeta's works. I ain't got to worry about Sister Gwen's works. I ain't got to worry about Minister Jackson's works. Because he ain't downloading those works to me. He's downloading the works that God has set aside for me. He's downloading those into my spirit. So when I got saved, my spirit connected again with his spirit. And his spirit began to download into my spirit to go here, to do that, to go over there, to do thus and such. Because at the end of the day, it is the works that God has provided for you to do that you'll be, that you'll be judged for. Quit trying to do everybody else's stuff. Get on your own works. But it says the Holy Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. He intently investigates the works of God so that he can then, he can then download that into your and my spirit. Because y'all do know that we are going to be judged according to our works. If you are a believer... And Paul tells us that later on in first in, 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 uh, action, in the third chapter, he tells us that, that we are going to be judged according to our works. If you are a believer, your sin has already been judged at the cross. Uh -huh. You ain't got to worry about your sin being judged. The, the, blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus has already judged your sin at the cross when you got saved. Yeah. But your works will be judged. Yeah. If you're not saved, then your sin is going to be judged and you're going to go to hell. That's just, that's just really what it is. But when you are saved, your works will be judged. And the question is, what works will you set before the Lord? Well, in other words, he said that there, there, there's a standard. He said that you can set up either gold, silver, diamonds, or precious stones, or you can set up wood, hay, and stubble. And he said that if you set up wood, hay, and stubble, they're going to be burned in the fire. That's your works. In other words, when you send up works that really, have, that really don't have nothing to do with God, they don't get burned. So the work he set you here to do, he said, when you send those up, then those will, those will stand the test of the fire. So when you get um, held accountable, when you are judged, he said, then you, you can be judged by your works. Some of us are going to get in just by the skin of our teeth. Some of us, as a, of fact, as a matter of fact, Paul says here that it's going to be so tight that your hinder parts will still be smoking when you go through the judgment of fire. Ah. Read on in chapter 3, you'll see what I'm talking about. But the Holy Spirit intently investigates the works of God, so, that, so then therefore we know what God has for us. We know where God wants us to go. We know who God wants us to be. We know what God wants us to perform. We know. Yeah. And then guess what? So the Kim, we ain't got to worry about the outside chatter. We ain't got to worry about what people think we ought to do. We ain't got to worry about what folks think we ought to do. Say one more time for the Holy Spirit. We ain't got to worry about what folks think we ought to be doing. Because of the Holy Spirit, the sixth sense, then told us. He's investigating. He searched the deep things of God. He's come back. He's communicated those deep things to you and I. The question is, are we hearing what he's communicating? All right. So, so not only does the sixth sense immaculately illuminate the ways of God so that you can walk in the ways of God, not only does he intently investigate the works of God so he can tell you what your works are to be, because, you know, Jesus, Jesus said that I'm, I'm only doing what my father told me to do in the book of John. He said, I'm doing what my father told me to do. I'm, I'm, I'm abiding by what he, the works he has sent me to do, not nobody else's works. 
But then thirdly, um, the Holy Spirit, the, the sixth sense, will incontrovertibly intimate the will of God. I'm going to write that down so you because I want you to get this. Incontrovertibly. In other words, I-N-C-O-N-T-R-O-V-E-R-T-I-B-L-Y. All, that, all incontrovertibly means is this, simply put. It's, it's a $10 word for something that simply says that he will clearly, clearly intimate, talk, announce to you the will of God. Incontrovertibly intimate simply means he will clearly, clearly, uh, you know, that we're indisputably, in other words, it, it can't, there's no disputing with it that you know this is the will of God for you. He's going to tell you what the will of God is for you. We need help with that. I know I do on a regular basis. I've been, I'm, what is, I'm 50, I've been saved for, 40, for about 45, 46 years, been preaching for about maybe 30, been passing for 25 of those 30. And I still sometimes, so they had to have to go back and make sure I'm walking in the will of God. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't ask my mama. No, I can't ask my wife. Yes. I can't ask Minister Jackson, what does God will for me? Right. I got to go to my sixth sense. Because right. he already know. Yeah, yeah. Well, where you see that? Look at verse 11 and 12. He says, for... For what man knows the things of a man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Amen. Nobody knows what God has for you except for God himself. Amen. Quit asking other folk God's will for your life. You got to ask God his will for your life. And when you ask him, the Holy Spirit is going to download into you what God has said to you. And you better be ready to listen and you better be ready to obey what he downloads into your spirit. He will incontrovertibly intimate the will of God. When you walk away from that conversation, you will know beyond a shadow of a doubt that this is God's will for your life. And when you start having, when you start having doubts, go back to him. Because guess what's going to happen? He's going to reassure you. Or he's going to adjust you. But he knows what God's will is for you. I remember um, Sister Lucy, when I, was, when I was being called to ministry, you know, and um, I would go to Pastor Davis and I would say, man, something's going on. I, I don't know what's happening, what's happening. You know, and he would say, just go and pray. Just go and pray. Go and pray. Uh-huh. And so finally, after I got done praying and, and I, got, I got mad at him, I'm like, dude, just tell me what, what's going on. He never tell me. The reason why he wouldn't tell me because he told me afterwards, he says, he says, he says Reverend, he says, I wouldn't tell you what God was doing for you because you have to know from God, I can't tell you. But God has to tell you because if God tells you, God going to hold on to you. If God calls you, he going to keep you. He says, I can't call you, but God, when God calls you, he will keep you wherever he calls you. Yeah. When you know the will of God in your life. And you know what God has called you to be, where God has called you to go, then God will keep you wherever He sends you. But you got to be able to do that knowing the will of God. And nobody knows the will of God except the sixth sense, the Spirit of God, who knows God. I'm almost done. Last point. This sixth sense will also. Intimately integrate the word of God into your life. He will intimately integrate the word of God into your life. Look at verse 13. The, these things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches us, but which what? Who? The Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. He says, we don't need, we won't be taught by man's words. But what the Holy Spirit is going to do, he's going to leave man's word to the side. He's going to intimately integrate the word of God to you. And he's, in other words, he's going to bring that word of God into you. And he's going to cause the word of you and the word of God to become one. That's what it means to integrate. It means to be, to, to be able to bring together. And you bring together as one. 
And so the Holy Spirit and only the Holy Spirit can integrate. He can, and not only does he integrate it, he intimately integrates the word of God. Okay, I'm almost done. Uh, in Psalm 19, in Psalm 19, look what it says in Psalm 19. It says, um, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. Statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is you know, clean, enduring. The judgment of the Lord are true and all. Look at it. In all this, he's talking about the word of God. Uh-huh. The word of God is enlightening. The, little, the, the word of God will convert the soul. The word of God will make you wise. Also than honey and a honeycomb. He said, there are more to be desired than gold, than even fine gold, the word of God. Yeah. But see, the Holy Spirit will intimately integrate this word into your life. Yeah. Because only he can do that. Yeah. As a matter of fact, the word can be integrated into your life when you just memorize the word. Oh, hold on. See, because just, just simple memorization of the word, it keeps it right here. Right, right, right. The word of God can't be integrated into your life if you just read it. Because if you just read it, you kind of, you know, let it loose and, you, and you'll get away from it. The word of God can't simply be uh, integrated into your life if you just study it. Because studying it simply means it's intellectual. Yeah. See, the word of God, I, I, get, I got this now, and I teach this to the, to the ministers. The word of God has to, I call it the method. And I'm done after this, so just so you understand, I, I, but I got to show you the method. Because in the word of God, it takes all of that. Uh-huh. But it takes the Holy Spirit leading you in all of this. Yeah, yeah. See, the word of God must, must be read, studied, yeah. meditated upon, prayed upon, yeah. and applied. Right. You missed that. See, the word of God must be read, yeah. studied, yeah. meditated on, yeah. prayed on, yeah. and then applied. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's right. Now, I could go to the $10 words if you want me to, yeah. Uh, because, see, the word of God, when it's read, it simply introduces and illuminates the word to you. So because now when you read the word, it just introduces the word to you. It kind of illuminates. That, that's reading the word. But then when you study the word, it begins to inform your intellect. Because the study of the word begins, and you begin to break it down and be, you begin to understand it. But while you are breaking it down, uh, you're breaking it down intellectually. So that's why you can't stop at the study and the reading. You got to go to the meditating of it as well, too. Because the meditate the word called internal interaction. That's when you get the Holy Spirit involved. Because now in the meditation of the word, what happens is the Holy Spirit starts to tell you, go here, go here, do that. This is what it means. Here's where it is. And so therefore, because of the meditation, you begin an interaction. Don't miss this. So you got to read, you got to study, you got to meditate, but then you have to pray it. Because praying it intimately, that's what's called the intimate interplay. Because when you pray the word, you're now talking to God, and he's now talking to you. And God is doing most of the talking, as a matter of fact. Because when we pray the word, here it is, we intensify the, the influence and the impact of the word of God in our life. But you can't stop with praying. You've got to be able to apply what you pray, that you meditate on, that you study, that you have read. The word of God, the Holy Spirit says, when you do these things under my guidance, when you do these things, I will intimately integrate the word of God in your life. And you will have that base. You will have that foundation. You will have that st- that, that rock that you need to stand on when the winds blow in your life. You will know what the word of God says in your life. When the, when the, when the winds and the destruction, the destructive winds and the hurricanes blow in your life, it will blow you to and fro. But because you are now on the word of God. And you know what the word of God says. And you know how God has intimated that word to you. And you know where God is in the word. They will come and go. The winds will, will blow. The rains will come. The hurricanes will blow. But at the end, you will stand like a tree planted by the rivers of water. That will still bring forth fruit in its due season. Whose leaves will not wither. No matter what the season is, because you're planted, and because you allow the sixth sense to intimately integrate the Word of God in your life. That's the awesome advantage of the ascension. We get the sixth sense, y'all. And He comes and He immaculately 
illuminates the ways of God. He comes and he intently investigates the works of God for you and I. He comes and he incontrovertibly intimates the will of God yeah. for you and I. And he comes yeah. and he intimately integrates the word of God yeah, sir, yeah. for you and I. Yeah. You can't make it without him. You may think you can, but you can't. This is the awesome advantage of the ascension. The world don't have what we have. That's why it, you, that's why I don't, I, I don't understand sometimes where you, where you can just sit and just not do anything in worship. That's why I can't understand sometimes where you can just, just, just kind of sit down and like feel nothing when it comes to Elohim who is what? Deliberately, deliberately Maybe it's because it's just still in your head, trying to make its way down to your heart. I'm hoping that's the case. That's the awesome advantage of the ascension. He brings our sixth sense so that we can depend upon God to direct us where we need to go. Father, we thank you for this time of sharing. We thank you for these are people we pray now. Somebody have been helped here on this day. As we close this conversation, Father, on the awesome advantage of the ascension, we pray, God, that somebody has been helped here, that your word will find a place in their heart that will grow, that it will find fruitful, that it will find uh, um, soil, God, that it can grow in our lives. We say thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory. We give you honor. In Jesus' precious name we do pray. And Father, we pray now for those who are listening, those who are here, those who are listening virtually, that if someone, God, has not been saved, that they don't have the awesome advantage that we do, that they will then, Father, cry out to you, what must I do to be saved? And I pray, Father, that they will accept Jesus Christ in their, Lord, in their heart as their Lord and Savior. I pray, God, they will repent of their sins, and cry out to you. And as they cry out to you, God, I pray that they will open their hearts to Jesus to let them in, let them in, and become their Lord and their Savior. We say thank you. We give you praise. We give you glory and honor. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.